السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I want to thank Sheikh Osama for his explanation. Is anybody everybody more confused now than when he started about what Tafsir is? Because I know I am. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about uh, conceptualizing the whole thing. So there is a growing misconception in the world that Islam, the religion that we practice through which we feel the book, the Quran, somehow advocates open animosity and hatred, or at the very least, uh, Muslims cannot make friends with people of other faiths. And it's further alleged, alleged that such claims particularly aimed at Jewish and Christian people. Uh, more importantly, and almost un unfortunately also at the same time, this claim is usually reinforced by the concurrence of scholars. Uh, therefore, it becomes really important uh, to really look at the claims and look at the evidences that are there. Sheikh Osama said a great thing about looking at everything, and we're going to go through everything, and I'm going to try to do it in a half hour. So I have ten pages, so we're going to roll fast. Um, so it becomes important that we try to look at these claims. And this is by reviewing the evidentiary claim that is quoted by scholars and re that refute this. Or more accurately, to, to show us the guidance that is in the Quran. Uh, following the events of September 11th, 7-7, you know, everything that we've lived over the last uh, 14 years of our existence as Muslims in America, uh, there is one verse that is oft repeated. It's turn on the radio in America, you turn on the radio in London, you turn on the television, anywhere in the world, you're going to hear fundamentalists on all sides, whether they're atheists, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, whatever, they're going to say this verse. And this is the verse that appears in sort of the uh, Maida, the 51st verse of this, which is, O you who believe, do not take Jews and Christians as awliya. Keep switching mics until we get one that works for a full ten minutes. Um, so before we go into in depth on this ayah, before we really look at what this ayah is saying, I think it's important that we we understand again the verse in its context. Uh, we have to examine in depth to clarify the verse in its context. So we need to compare the Bible and the Quran. We can use certain images to illustrate this that would really bring it home to us. There's a major stylistic difference between the Bible and the Quran. A major stylistic difference uh, between these two scriptures. We could say, for example, that the Bible is more like a flowing stream. Right? It has a beginning and it has an end. If one reads the Bible from beginning to end, they're going to come up with various verses, stories, and chapters of the bird book. You start with Genesis, which is the creation. You move through the world of first man and the first woman, then proceed on through time to even patriarchs and judges to the time of Christ. Uh, all the way to the end of the world. It's a flowing river. It doesn't stop. Right? It's a, it's a book. It has a beginning and it has an end. Now, if one reads the, the Quran, it's a little different. So if we use imagery to illustrate the Quranic revelation, it would be like an individual standing on a mountaintop at night and overlooking a dark valley and there's a lightning flash. And in that lightning flash, we can see a little bit of the landscape here. And there's another lightning flash, we can see a little bit of the landscape here. And another one, we can see the little bit of the landscape together. But if the sun was out, we would see the whole valley, and we'd be able to walk through it. So the idea of the Quran, it's like lightning flashes here and there. We have to know where to go find those lightning flashes to put together the whole light. Are you following me on that? Because that's the way the Quran was revealed, right, in these things, in these individual... Uh, lightning flashes, right? And we would not be able to draw any conclusion that these things were related initially. It would just be flashes of light here and flashes of light there. But eventually we'd be able to put them together if we know how to do that. One will often read sections of the text and wonder what is the relationship between them. And how do these work? How do the stories go? And in fact, the Quran doesn't have stories like in the Bible. There's only one complete story from beginning to end, and that's the story of Yusuf, Joseph, and Asa. The rest of the stories throughout the Bible are in different places, and they really have a lot to do with what was going on with the early events of the Muslim community. Revelation came down as it was needed to explain things within the lives of the Muslims. 
So we're going to look at the broad concept of friendship in the Quran. The Quran has over 40 references to friendship. Over 40 references to friendship. Furthermore, the Quran uses six different words to say what friendship is. More importantly, the term friendship should not be used to define these six terms as a generic term. Osama, Osama talked about generic terms, generic meaning. Friendship doesn't really work for a lot of these words in the way that we understand friendship in English. The English term simply refers to one who is attached to another person by feeling affection or a personal regard, or one who's not hostile towards another one. This is the English definition of friendship. So we want to examine these six words, and we want to provide, I'm going to provide an assessment of the references in the Quran that will provide clear explanation for the contextual use of these words. But it's going to provide it in their generic terms. We have to get past this idea of just thinking this word means this. So the first one is khalil. Khalil is used in the Quran uh, seven times. And it's probably the closest to that generic meaning in English, if we look at it. So it's really defined as someone who is a friend. But it's not like all the way there, right? So it's in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Nisa, Surah Al-Ibrahim, Surah Al-Isra, Surah Al-Nur, Surah Al-Rakan, and Surah Al-Zukhruf. So it's in all these sorts. And we lack time to look at all these, because I don't want to bore everybody to death with, my, with me, so I want to just move to it quickly. So the first one I want to talk about, we're going to talk about two. Who can be better in religion than the one who submits his whole self to God, does good and follows the way of Ibrahim, of Abraham, and the true to faith? For Allah did take Ibrahim for a khalid. He did take Ibrahim, Abraham, for a friend. So this is the closest meaning in a generic sense that we can get to that word friend. The next one is, Allah SWT says in Surah Al-Nur, He says, There is no restriction on the blind, nor any restriction on the lame, nor any restriction on the sick, nor yourselves. If any of you eat from your houses, or the houses of your fathers, or the houses of your mothers, or the houses of your brothers, or the houses of your sisters, or the houses of your father's brothers, or the houses of your father's sisters, or the houses of your mother's brothers, or the houses of your mother's sisters, or from wherever you hold the keys, or from the house of your friend. Your khalid. No sin is on you whether you eat together or go apart. The times the word khalil or its derivatives are used do not relate to Muslims' relations with people of other faiths. It, it's, it's, it, they don't go together. Like It's just a general, generic word for friend. It can be used for anybody. So even in this one, it clearly states that Muslims can eat with their non-Muslim non friends. So this is an example of where the word friendship is used. It says for everybody, not just for an individual. Not just for Muslims only, but the word is a generic sense, meaning friendship. Anybody whom you have relations with that you're not hostile to. So that could be anybody that you're not hostile to. What is somebody you're hostile to? What are they? Enemy. Enemy, that's right. Why'd you say that like you meant it? <laughs> so the etiquette of dietary requirements and things like this are really irrelevant. We won't get into that. But really this verse is clear that we can eat with people who we have no idea. So I have these my shape, I have that. The next one is Sadiq, which is an Arabic term which means true and sincere friend. So one may refer to his closest friend or her closest friend as this word. This is the word that Muhammad Saw said he used for Abu Bakr. He called him as Sadiq. He called him his closest friend, his most intimate friend. Huh? And we find that this is used, God Allah SWT uses this term in uh uh Shura out of the hundred and seven of the first hundred and one. Referring to the fact that no intimate or no true friend will be of any help on the Day of Judgment. Again, this does not refer to people of any religion. It just says no one of no good friends, there'll be nobody there for you on the Day of Judgment. It doesn't say whether they're a person of other faith or they're a Muslim. No one. There'll be no Sadiq. There'll be no person there for you. No intimate friend, no best friend. That BFF stuff will be over and you'll be by yourself. So that's what that is saying. Uh, the next one is Hanim. And this term is a synonym, a synonym for Sadiq. They, they mean the same thing. Um, Hanim. Hanim. However, it's provided a feeling of warmth and intimate friendship. So it goes like a little extra. It has a little warmth. It's, it's the best of sincere friends. The best of sincere friends. And Allah uses this word only twice in the 
uses in the same ayah in Surah Al-Shura and in uh, Surah Al-Mahraj. Uh, he uses it in these two verses. In both cases, it is used to emphasize that the closest friends will be of no help on the Day of Judgment. No matter how cool you are, no matter how much you love this person, no matter how much this person has your back, regardless of any faith, of anything, they'll be of no benefit to you at all. That the only thing that will be a benefit to you is your actions. Because those will be the only things that you possess on that day. The word again has no relevance to relationships with people other than this fact that they won't be there. The next one is Tawadla. This word is used in connotation with friendship insofar as it relates to turning to someone to follow or Follow someone for their help. Like they have something that you need or something that you want. Or someone someone turns to or follows only for help. Uh, out of trust or out of need. The word tawala cannot be used to suggest friendship, per se, because it, it's a need. You, you, you're forced on it. You need something from it. So that's not really friendship. It's so that's the, the difference in there. The root is derived from the word wadi. Um, which is a key word in the misconception by those who don't understand uh, the ayat that we're going to talk about, right? So Allah SWT uses the word seven times in the Quran. He uses it in Surah Al-Ma'idah, uh, uses it in Surah Al-Araf, uses it in Surah Al-Hajj, Mujadala, and Surah Al-Saf. Huh? Now I'm going to do two. So he says, Allah says, Verily, my protector is Allah who revealed the book. He supports, helps the righteous. He helps and supports the righteous. Huh? And the next one is, above the evil one, meaning uh, Satan, Shaitan, is the creed that whoever turns to him for support, again, support, here's the word, and help, he will, he will be astray. He will be led astray. And Satan will guide him uh, to the penalty of fire. So that word, Tawala, doesn't have anything to do with friendship, because how many people here are friendships with Satan? How many people? Anyone? No, it's a forced thing. It's, it's out of turning to someone and following them, out of some kind of need. Huh? The next one is Wadi. And it's not the Disney movie. It's the word Wadi. Huh? And a majority, if not all, of the misconceptions about an incorrect commentary comes from this particular word. So most everything that is that we know of, that we think of, is because of this word, and it's, it's the wrong way we look at it. And it's used 20 times in the Quran. In the form of wali or awliya. And in the verse we're looking at, the word awliya is the one, that, but it's the plural of this word. And this word requires an in-depth explanatory interpretation. To use the word friend in its generic tense here, its generic meaning, is not only incorrect, but it's incredibly misleading. It's incredibly misleading to use the word friend here. Wali has the, the meaning of protector, Subordinate who was unable or unwilling to stand up to the superior, however, is content with one state and subordination. He's happy to be under somebody. It also has a favorite servant or companion, and it means minion. You know, not like the, what my kids watch, but you know, the minion, <laughs> someone who's your, your evil companion. In essence, the word wali has two has a two way relationship. Where one party is superior in rank and has authority, and the other party is subordinate to that authority and is happy with that condition. They're happy with that. Okay, so the, if we look at the most common understanding of this, is the word just refers to a human being who submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When that human being is fully submitted to Allah, we call him what? We call him a wali, we call him wali Allah, we call him a friend or a saint of God. But the, it's, again, it's an inaccurate translation, right? It's an approximate equivalent to what we can come up with in English. So it's as close as we can get to what it really means, huh? Now, in terms of society, a good position, a good example, is the position of a colonial power who comes in and it takes the land from everybody. It comes in and it colonizes the land, and then it says to everybody, that we have the good will, the colonizer has the will and the intent to provide protection for the colonized to benefit them. This is also wali. But this is a negative connotation of the word, right? This is something we don't want. How many people want to be colonized? Speaking as an Irish American? 
my, my people have been colonized since 1173. It's not, it's not fun. Uh, back, to the, to back to the text, though. So in context, the Quran, it uses this word in the following verses. It uses the Nadi Imran, 28th Ayah, Surah Tanisa, 89, 139, 144, Surah Al-Ma'idah, 51, 57, and 58, Surah Al-Anam, Surah Al-Araf, Surah Al-Anfal, Surah Al-Yunus, Surah Al-Mariam, Surah Al-Asab, Surah Al-Fusiyat. I mean, it uses it 20 times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this word wali and awliya. In all the verses, the word shows a relationship to either between a person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or between a person and another person. So it's always going to show a relationship either between us and Allah or us and somebody else. You guys with me? You have anything shouted out at me? Any questions? Save them to the end. Okay, so now we go back to Surah al the first the ayah that we're talking about. So Allah says, O oh, you who believe, yeah, you had Athena Avenue, O oh, you who believe, don't take Jews and Christians as your awliya. Don't take them as your friends. It's always translated as friends and protectors. Now, when we consult the traditional commentaries of the Quran, we are told that this verse was revealed in a particular moment in history. Again, Sheikh Usama brought this up perfectly. We always have to know why that verse was revealed. What was its sub? Why? Why did it come down? Why do we? Why do we need to care about it? Because in what moment in the early life of the Muslim community it had to deal with? To understand this verse, it is necessary to explain the essential situation of the Muslims at that time living in Arabia. This is how the only way we can understand this verse. So before the fifty-first verse of Surah Al-Ma'idah was revealed, the Prophet saw him. And all the Muslims had only recently migrated from Mecca to Medina, some 400 kilometers to the north, right? They had done so according to our history because of persecution that they were subjected to and their, the hands of their, at the hands of their fellow tribesmen and relatives in Mecca, right? We all know the story of what happened. So they had to move. They had to get up. They had to go. The, t the situation was too tough there. They needed to leave. So I'm going to quote... <laughs> today is, uh, our hero for the day is actually a Tabari guy, so uh, go and buy that if you can. So according to one of the earliest and most famous commentaries of the Quran, a Tabari, he said, it was not long after the migration from Medina uh, that this verse was revealed. He said it either came down after the Battle of Badr or after the Battle of Badr. So it was within the second or third year that this verse came down. So there was a lot of things going on in the early days of the Muslim community. It only consisted five minutes. I have like uh, I have like eight pages left to go, man. All right, eight minutes. Okay, I'm gonna have to go fast. Okay, so in the early days, it only the Muslim community only consisted of a few hundred people. And they had already left Mecca and they were in Medina, but the Meccans kept trying to confront them. They kept trying to come at them. So a small number of Muslims, they decided that maybe this is a real possibility that we could be destroyed. There's a real possibility that the Meccans could come and they with all the other tribes of Arabia and they could kill us. So we need to look out for some other tribes that are strong. So there are some strong Jewish tribes and there are some strong Christian tribes that we can go and we can make a deal with that they protect us in case things fell down. So some Muslims thought that this was a great idea to make these things, to make these alliances with these tribes, not as a Muslim ummah, not in the name of the Prophet Sallallahu but as an individual making this pledge to these people that they would now be your protector. You follow me on that? Can I get more than five minutes? Five, seven. Okay. So this is a stark reality. This was the stark reality at the time of the era, of the Arabs, huh? It was only through the protection of one's tribe or alliances. That, the, that they could survive. An individual couldn't make it on his own. This is the reality. If you were by yourself, you would starve. If you didn't have a clan to protect you, you were, you were at the, the evil of the people. They weren't going to treat you kindly. So from the perspective of Islam, however, the Prophet also didn't realize that this young community faced a great peril that could not allow this dissension. It couldn't allow individuals to go out and make their own peace treaties. So this would cause... Dissension in the ranks of the faithful would create a very, would create a, a hardship between everybody. If I'm saved and you're not, what's going to happen? If I make a deal for me, but Usama and Sheikh Hassan aren't saved, 
this becomes a problem, right? So from an Islamic point of view, such actions, had they been allowed, would have been a kind of communal suicide that would have seriously undermined Muslim unity. It would have destroyed everything that had been built to have individuals make these pacts. It broke the morale of the community and perhaps caused many individuals making such alliances to lack fortitude and face the danger. To be able to stand up when they saw those moments when their hearts were in their throats. If they had a pact with somebody from behind, they wouldn't care. They wouldn't have that fortitude to stand up and defend everybody else because they were safe. You seeing the, the historical context here? translation of awliya as friends is completely incorrect. So when we look at this and we look at it through the reason why it was revealed, when we look at it, the reason why it was revealed and the time that we were lived, that the Muslims were in, we know that this awliya can't be friends. It's an impossibility to mean that. Does everyone agree on that that's here? Yeah. Everyone who's streaming, the four people who are streaming, do you agree with it? Who <laughs> said Friend. Anyway, in maybe one day, what translation says friends and protector. Actually, in all the translations of the Quran, it says, no, I have one, it says, it says friends or the, the lies are Can I finish? We can talk. I have two minutes. Um, it should be rendered in accord with another and uh, of its traditional Arabic meanings as protectors or guardians in a strict military sense of the term. In a strict military sense of the term. Because what was going on? People were trying to enter into military pacts on their own. Follow me, Shikha Sama? So the verse should be read as, Do not take Christians and Jews as your military protectors. Depends on what that ayah was revealed. It should be rendered in accord with another of its traditional Arabic meanings as protectors or guardians, with a strict military sense of the term. Uh, the verse should be read as, Do not take Christians or Jews as your military protectors. Um, supplementary evidence. There are other forms of guidance in the Quran that respect, that support respectful friendships between Muslims and people of other faiths. For example, Muslim men are permitted to marry women of, of, uh, of other faiths, women of the book, of Jews and Christians. Uh, the Quran informs us that one would find comfort with each other in marriage, in Surah al -Rum, and that men are a peril for women and vice versa, in Surah al -Baqarah. Uh These are certainly very friendly and intimate relationships. Uh, which applies to all marriages. One could not be married if they don't have a friend in that marriage. It's impossible to have those kind of intimate relationships if you're not friends. So when Allah says this, He's not just putting it to Muslim-Muslim only marriages. He's also extending it to men who marry women of other faiths. And then he says, O oh mankind, we have created you from a male and female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. 
Verily, the most honorable of you with Allah, with God, is those is that who is most pious. Verily, Allah is all knowing and all aware. This verse it confirms that human beings are equal. We're equal. The only thing that separates us is what? What separates us from each other? Anybody? What separates us? Taqwa. Taqwa, right? Piety. God consciousness. That's the only thing that separates us. And who can see that? Can I see that? Who sees that? Allah. Allah. So we're all, the way we need to look at each other is we're all equal. I don't know your sins. You don't know my sins. Alhamdulillah. So we're all equal. Like Sheikh Osama said last night, we're all continually committing <laughs> sins. Does that look interesting? <laughs> so this verse... It confirms that human beings are all equal, and in fact, that we're here to benefit one another. We're here to benefit from one another. Like friends, people are encouraged to know one another and to learn from one another. You can't have a friendship with somebody if you're not learning from them. You can't have a friendship with someone if you're not knowing them. That verse is in uh, Surah Al-Hujra, 13 verse. I want to take a moment to show a similarity in Revelation between the Quran which has one whole, one verse that has often been misquoted about friendship. And this is in no way to slander or besmirch uh, the people of the book. And I want to make that clear that this is in no way to show uh, enmity or hatred towards Christians or Jews. This is just to point out the fact that there are similarities in the Abrahamic tradition. And that, that's all I'm doing here, is to point out that there are similarities in this. So the next time that someone says this, you can say, look, it's, it's in all of us. It's an Abrahamic faith tradition thing. It has nothing to do with Muslims or this or that. Huh? Not in a condemning way, not in a screaming way, not in an argument way, but just to, to, to show us that we're not the only ones. Huh? Um, so when I looked into the Bible, I found one, over 100 verses, over 100 verses that condemn friendship with the other. For the sake of time, I'm only going to give three. So 2 Corinthians 6.14 Paul says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So he's saying, don't be equally yoked with unbelievers. Don't be with them. Don't be their friends. Don't, don't hang out with them. It's clear, right? Matthew, Matthew 12, 30. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. So again, very binary understanding of religion, right? Whoever is not with me is against me. Very binary. And the last one is 2 John, uh, uh, 2 John 1, 10 through 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, meaning the teaching of what? Jesus. Jesus, Christianity. Do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. I did this for a joint reason. Because this shows how easily it is to take verses out of context. How easy it is for me to misquote Christian scripture. To not take the verse that comes before it, or take the verse that comes after it, but just to quote things willy-nilly. See what I'm saying? So it can be done with any religion. So I don't think that we're uh, the victims of anything. Huh? So in conclusion, the very term is that. The very term of the religion that we state that we practice refers to a peaceful and willing submission. And in it, it has the connotation that peace and harmony is the norm. It has the connotation that peace and harmony is the norm and the means. Follow me, In terms of relationship, Islam has developed jurisprudence which is referred to as Muhammadat which is transactional interactions, under the subcategory of mashirat, which is social interactions with all human beings regardless of religion, race, or gender. You can ask there are people here who study fit at high levels. We have, we have this in our, in our books of jurisprudence, the way that we deal with each other. It's positive conduct revolves around one simple concept, and that's doing right for a collective benefit. Again, that's doing right for a collective benefit. Linas. That's an important thing to remember for people. This would be the unspoken objective of any true friendship. It is reasonable to conclude, therefore, that Islam advocates goodness and friendship with whomsoever can deliver their goodness. 
A person would not seek a bad friend um, unless there's completely something wrong with them when you seek out someone who talks to you evil. Your heart has to be spiritually dead to seek out those kind of companions. What Islam provides further reassurance about is that if someone intends to take advantage of your courteous friendship, one should not succumb to them out of fear for their best friend, our best friend, is our creator. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So out of all the friendships that we should have, out of all the relationships that we should rectify, it should be with Allah first. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Following me is uh, our beloved Sheikh Hassan.